Good morning, Sierra Grace Fellowship. Thank you, uh, those of you that have joined us in the building uh, today. Let's all stand, and we're going to uh, sing this uh, song of praise that has become one of my, my favorite songs, the simplicity of it and the, uh, uh, the words, especially the chorus. It starts with always true and always kind. Let's sing this together.
and be glad in it. Amen to that. Well, that's something we can wake up each day and say. And I encourage you to sing that song throughout your week. Uh, let it be an encouragement to you. Well, good morning, good evening, Sierra Grace. You guys may be seated. Glad to have you here with us this evening. I was talking to uh, some folks this morning, and one of the things that folks who've joined us on Thursday night have said is it's good to be in the building, right? To be in this place that we've been the body of Christ, and we're glad to have you, and thanks for coming with us. One of the things that we've decided as a staff, because our numbers have not exceeded what the county have said, that we're going to remove the requirement to email to sign up, right? So if you would like to, as part of Sierra Grace, join us on Thursday night as we re record this. 
we would love to have you. This is probably our service where we are the most um, vigilant on socialing distance, so we have our masks on and et cetera, et cetera, and following the rules that the county has given us to keep us safe. So, amen, we'd love to have you with us. I want to just, as talk about a little bit, I'm not the sermon tonight, Brian's going to come teach us about um, growing up under COVID-19, but I want to talk about uh, one of the topics that I've been dealing with over and over again in a good way, and that is being the united body of Christ. One of the challenges that we have is that there's a lot of things in this world now that we disagree on, and it seems like as a, a, a people, we're getting better at disagreeing and worse at being united. Um, but our calling as God's people in this place is to set aside the things that aren't central to us and come together united around our faith and our love for Jesus um, and be gracious and kind to those folks that are in a different place than I is. I, I is. <laughs> I is. <laughs> I am, and uh, be united around that. So that's just been a challenge for all of us as we work through this thing. And we've been working hard as the staff and the leadership of Sierra Grace to try to um, cater to our body, to make sure that there's options there as we work together um, in this idea to both care for the body and our community um, and be who God wants us to be. On that note, um, We've given you a bunch of options for how you can worship and be part of this body, or at least specifically three. One of them is because is we're all in kind of a different place on what our response to COVID is and what we're comfortable with as well. And so we are recording this live stream on Thursday night um, and make it so that those folks who are at risk or don't feel comfortable coming out can be a part and worship with us at home. And I've talked to many of you this week who've thanked me that that's available. And they've told me, especially to tell you guys, thank you for the work you're doing to make that possible. The other option is if you want to get out and see some people, but in a more um, socially dis distant and safe environment, I think that this option here on Thursday night is a great one. We take our masks and our safety seriously. Um, you can come and join us. We're six feet apart. We're doing everything we can to make that happen. And uh, this is a great option for you if you're uncomfortable in a place um, where things aren't as tight as they are in others. And finally, we have our home groups meeting in six different locations um, that have been a place where people have enjoyed gathering together and um, we're doing the same content at all pl three places, um, but we're working hard to try to make sure that there's something for you, someone, something for everybody in our body that fits where they're at in this journey through COVID-19 and, and what my right response is to that. So, um, we got to work together, and uh, you've been great about doing that. The elders met this week, and we talked about what we're going to do past um, this week as we said that we were going to meet here and do the home church thing through June. And as we examined our opportunities and talked to our host, we decided that our hosts are willing that we're going to continue to do the model that I've just described to you and continue to meet in home churches here and then the live stream through the month of August is our plan. Now, one thing that we all know is plans change quickly in the world of COVID-19, do you? So there might be a spike coming up or something happens that causes us to reconsider that, um, but we prayfully consider that that's our best option to move forward and be the body of Christ in this people. And I think it's worth noting is that we're united together. Um, we are not a people bound by the walls in this building, huh? We are a people that are bound by our common bond in Jesus and the hope that he gives us. And so we need to keep um, pushing forward and making sure that that keep, continues to be the center of who we are as a people. And you've done a great job as far as I can tell so far. So that's the big announcement for tonight. We're going to continue in this format that we've been enjoying and hope that it works out for all of you. Um, the last announcement that I have is we do have a new women's Bible study that's meeting on Wednesday night at the Lovano's house over here off of Madsen Drive. Um, it's uh, at Madsen Drive in Auburn. Um, uh, Kim is leading that, I believe, and if you want more information on that, you can check the website or talk to Kim, and they would love to have you come and join them. So John and team, thank you again for all you're doing for us, and let's continue to worship.
is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. And evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. Let's sing that again. Days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. And evil is rising, you're rising higher. With power to save, with power to save, you keep hope alive.
No, Todd, you're praying today. That's right. We talked about that. <laughs> I just saw Gary and thought, wait, that was last week. Gary can pray too. I'm sure, sure he will as we do that. Join me if you would. Let's go to our Father who loves us. Our Father, I just, uh, we come to you this day and um, we need you. Oh, we need you. We know um, that... Uh, Life is chaotic and unexpected these days, but you are everlasting and our rock who we can depend on. We pray to you this day that you would just fill us with hope and confidence, that we would keep our eyes on you, um, that you would be um, the thing that we cling to. We pray that as we do that, that you would unite us, unite us around you and your son who died that we might hope and life abundant and eternal and that uh, that would be the thing that 
gets us through our days. We pray for our health, um, for our nation, for our world, um, that you would bring us together um, and keep us strong with this virus and ask that you would just wipe it out, move it away. We pray for your provision, that you would take care of us. We know that uh, there are those that are short of work or out of work, and we know that you promised us your daily bread, and we would ask that you would do that again and again and again. And we're so thankful, those of us who've been taken care of so far and uh, tried not to take it for granted that you have been gracious and abundant in your provision for us too. We pray for leadership. I pray for the leadership of churches around the world and in Auburn. I pray for my friend Craig Kelly at Gold Country who's been sick, that your healing hand would be on him. I pray for our thank, pray for and thank you for the elders and the deacons and the staff here at Sierra Grace that have selfishly served you. I pray for the leaders of our county, for our state, and for our nation, um, that through this all that they would turn to you and see that you are where our hope comes from. Lord, Lord, we pray mostly for your lordship. We pray that we might be a people that turn to you, that trust in you, that we might be a people that uh, constantly day after day um, know that you are the one that gives us life and abundance. We pray that in all of this and all that we do that you're glorified. We pray that your kingdom would come and come quickly. And we pray that in all that we do, you might be glorified. We also ask that as Brian comes to teach us is that our hearts might be soft and in his words that you might be praised and that we might see you anew and clearer than we ever have before. In Jesus' name, who's our hope, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, worship team. Well, hello, Sierra Grace. Wherever you find yourself, however you find yourself, whoever you are with, we are glad that you have joined us. Whether you are here in the sanctuary with us as we record this, whether you are in your homes or with a few friends watching us online, or you are at one of our house churches scattered across the area, we are delighted that you are here with us as we get the grand privilege of lifting up our hearts and lifting up our voices in unity to our one God and Lord Jesus. So over the last few weeks, we have been looking at what does it look like to live as a Christian in this world. When the world takes a drastically different direction than what we thought it would four months ago, how do we respond? How is God inviting us to live into this new reality and live out our faith in the culture around us? So a few weeks ago, Todd talked about who we are as a church, that we are the body of Christ. Many of us grew up with that phrase, the church is more than a building. But it became a little bit more real in these last few months, hasn't it? When we couldn't get into the building. And we are incredibly grateful for this sanctuary. We are incredibly grateful for the opportunity to gather and worship here when we can. But this season has brought us to that profound, deep reality where we put our money where our mouth is and recognize that we are the body of Christ, living and active. And then the next week, Todd followed that up with how do we love our neighbors? How do we love and care for those here and our body together? And how do we care for the broader community around us? And then last week, Todd did a magnificent job of talking about three really big and important topics in one night. He addressed hope, he addressed death, and he addressed eternity in a beautiful and powerful way. Where do we place our hope, and how does our hope of eternity shape how we live into this world and approach the reality of death? And this evening, to follow up on that, we are talking about grief and lament. In this season, we have a lot of things that we are grieving. What do we do with that? How is God inviting us to release that and to encounter him in the midst of that? So as we dive into that, let's bow our hearts once more and pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that you are a God that can hold it all. That you are a God that is bigger than anything we can experience. 
that you are a God that doesn't invite us to shy away from the hard realities, but rather invites us to lay them at your feet before your throne. And that you meet us there. So tonight, as we open your word, would you give us eyes to see you? Would you give us ears to hear you? Would you give us hearts that would understand and that by the power of your Holy Spirit would be transformed into your image? We pray all of this for your glory. Amen. As I mentioned a minute ago, one thing we know in this season is that this has given us a lot of things to grieve. Events across the board were canceled. Graduations, vacations, birthday parties, sports was canceled. I know all of you are a little sad along with me that Todd and Vince have not mentioned the Giants and the Dodgers. So a few weeks ago, Rachel and I were supposed to take a vacation to Europe, and we were incredibly excited about this. As a family, with our families, we were going on a cruise around the Greek Isles, and we were going to get to see sites like Corinth and Ephesus, Athens, uh, Crete and Cyprus. We were going to get to go to Istanbul, and then finally, Rachel and I were going to go visit some of our beloved missionaries, Raymond and Brienne Langtat in the Czech Republic. I held the smallest amount of hope as things kept ratcheting up and getting canceled and canceled, and my family thought I was the weird one, and I am, but I was like, there's a sliver of hope we might make it. That didn't happen. And in the grand scheme of things, a vacation can seem inconsequential, and it is. It is inconsequential, but I was in my small group a couple weeks ago, and I sat there leading a discussion on 1 Corinthians and realized, I'm supposed to be in Corinth right now. I love my small group, but it doesn't quite compare. This loss of events, these loss of vacations and plans are just one way that grief shows up. As Todd prayed for us, others of us have lost their jobs or loss of income, or they're anticipating that coming up in the near future. And that is something heavy and something to grieve. We've lost family members and friends and loved ones. As I wrote the sermon, I was reminded of the year that I got to spend with John Balaam building the desk that hosts my laptop as I typed out this sermon. And his generosity of spirit, his generosity of time, his generosity of knowledge to help me build something far beyond my skill sets, something that is lasting and a living reminder of who he was. As we remember John Balaam, as we remember John Stock, Jim Stocks, We remember that loss has hit us in this season. To add on top of that, we've lost our ability to gather together to celebrate their lives and to mourn their losses. Our ability to come together in community has been significantly disrupted, hasn't it? In some cases, it's been completely stripped away and we felt isolated. These are just a few of the things that we grieve. For many people in the more recent weeks, the deaths of Rayshard Brooks, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and our response as a nation has weighed heavy on our hearts. I wanna take just a moment here and be pastoral. As Todd mentioned earlier, but I wanna, it bears repeating. Here at Sierra Grace, we have a diversity of opinion on a broad variety of things, including our response and how we interpret what has happened. I know this because I've had a lot of conversations with you in the last week or two weeks about this. We welcome and celebrate that there are a diversity of opinions at Sierra Grace. It's actually one of our hallmarks, but this can be incredibly challenging too, especially when we hold those things incredibly deeply and passionately. My hope and my heart is that in the spirit of unity, we can actually have healthy conversations, that we don't have to shy away from them but that the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ would shape how we interact with one another. That we could truly come with a heart and a spirit of unity and listen to each other. James 1.19 reminds us to be quick to listen, to be slow to speak, and to be slow to anger. I think those words are worth emphasizing in this season. I know some of you have had coffee with some of those that some others that have different perspectives, and it's been powerful to see 
us to come together in a spirit of unity, even when we differ on those things, and able to dialogue in a healthy manner. It goes up against our culture of increasing polarization and division. And so my hope and prayer is that that continues to go on. But tonight, I do want to simply acknowledge that in the context of talking about grief, their deaths have caused a lot of people deep heartache and pain. These are just a few of the concrete manifestations, but there's also others, whether we are conscious of them or not. So I don't know about you, but I have found myself grieving the loss of this sense of certainty. You know, I thought the world was heading in some direction. And as that stripped away, for me, it's a really good thing. This is an invitation of God to root ourselves in his faithfulness, not the way we think the world is going. But in order to fully enter into that reality, I actually have to grieve the loss of this perceived sense of certainty and this direction that we're going that I held unconsciously. That there's pain in that process. There's pain in the process of reorienting. Even good things that we have experienced are tinged with that touch of sadness. If any of you did a drive-by birthday party or a drive-by graduation, there was something novel and exciting about it, but at the end of the day, it wasn't the same as sitting in a room with all of those lovely people, was it? Things that we may have already been grieving are intensified in this season. They're just brought to the surface more and more. There was an article in the Harvard Business Review a couple months ago that said, that thing that you're feeling, that offness, that just sense of being a little off axis, it's grief. It's a, it's a building up of the losses of all of these things. I felt that for a few weeks, I felt just slightly off kilter, nothing majorly wrong. Sometimes I wasn't even conscious of it, but maybe you've had those moments where someone says something or asks you something and you snap at them, your wife, your husband, your children, and they're like, whoa, what just happened? And you take a breath, then you realize, oh, I wasn't actually mad at you. There was something else bubbling up underneath the surface, and you just happened to be the unfortunate recipient of what was there. You see, grief doesn't occur in just the large events and tragedies of life. It's certainly there, but grief can come to us in many forms and many different magnitudes. The question isn't whether or not this feeling of grief is right, but the question is, what do we do with it when we come face to face with this reality that we are grieving things, that there is loss involved in this season? How do we respond? So often we try to minimize this like I did earlier. Oh, this lost out vacation is no big deal or we avoid it and we just numb out on television or social media, or we, we engage it but we get stuck wallowing in it. I wanna suggest there's a different way that God invites us to engage with our sorrows and our losses. Throughout the scriptures, we are given a powerful way to address this and to enter in, and that way is called lament. Lamenting is a crying out to God about what we are experiencing and feeling, and it's inviting him to come and fix it. Somewhere between one-third and two-thirds of the Psalms are laments. Jeremiah was known as a weeping prophet and the author of the Book of Lamentations, a series of cries out to God about the sorrow and the brokenness of this world, the sorrow and brokenness that Jeremiah faced in his own life being a prophet. And so tonight, I want to invite you to look at one simple prayer and psalm of lament. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 13. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But, 
but I trust in your unfailing love and my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise because he has been good to me. And rawness and openness, David expresses his heart to the Lord. Not only does he feel under attack by his enemies, but he feels distant from God in the midst of it. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Will you hide your face from me all this time? Will you turn your back on me? How often have we felt that over the last few months? Do you even care about our situations, God? If you don't show up, our enemies will surely prevail. These words may feel uncomfortable to us, even borderline blasphemous. Can we really approach God like this? Can we really cry out in this form, in this rawness? Does this lack reverence? But God invites us to engage him in this way. Tonight, I want to assert two powerful things about lifting up our laments to the Lord. And the first is that voicing our laments and complaints to the Lord is a form of praise. God receives that as praise. This is a little bit mind-blowing to me, but he invites us and receives that as the same as we sing worship songs. As I mentioned earlier, a significant portion of the Psalms are laments. The Bible's book of worship and praise is filled with this kind of language, inviting us to cry out to God with exactly what is on our hearts. Peter reminds us to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. We get to cast our cares on him because he cares about the things that are on our heart and that are weighing us down. I'm reminded of Jesus, the shortest verse in scripture, Jesus wept. And the context of Jesus weeping is that the news of his friend Lazarus dying and the heartbreak that he sees in Mary and Martha. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the, back to life, and yet he weeps anyways. We don't have to censor our feelings when we come to God. We don't have to hide our losses, our frustrations, our questions before his throne. He meets us there. And yet he does more than meet us there. You see, lamenting, as we lift up our laments, as we lift these cries out to God, it actually asserts our trust in him. It asserts that of all the things we could do with what we're feeling, we are giving that back to God, asserting that in the end, we still trust in your goodness, your faithfulness, your power, your sovereignty. It's proof that we are in relationship with him. It's only because we walk in relationship, only because David walked in relationship with God that he could cry out with this kind of language. The second thing that I want to assert to you is that lamenting becomes a pathway to intimacy and rejoicing. Being able to share our rawness and our vulnerability before God is not only inviting, but it brings us closer to him. Psalm 34, 18 tells us that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. That when we feel these things and we express them, God comes and meets us in that place. And he does more than that. It's in that place of grief that lamenting gives way to rejoicing. Most of the Psalms end in the same way, but Psalm 13 is no exception. The last two verses, but I trust in your unfailing love Indeed, my heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Friends, sorrow and joy, grief and rejoicing are not mutually exclusive. Most of the Psalms begin with sorrow or a cry for help, but they end in this place of praise and rejoicing. In fact, when we travel through our grace, rather than minimize it, rather than try to circumvent it or avoid it and numb out, rather than wallowing in it, when we travel through that, our rejoicing becomes all the more real and rooted and grounded in Jesus. Our shouts of joy become rooted in his faithfulness in the midst of the brokenness. In the naming of our losses and our true feelings, God meets us there in powerful and redemptive ways. He does hear our cries and he does hear us. 
Rachel and I were listening to a webinar a few weeks ago, and they were talking about how we grow in Christ, and this topic of lament came up. And one of the ladies says, one of the ladies on the podcast said that when she laments, when she enters into that place fully, it almost always gives way to this rejoicing, and the rejoicing feels deep and powerful. She says, something lifts in me when I lament so that I'm able to praise. Something lifts in me when I start here, but it's not my ending place. My ending place is back in God's faithfulness and goodness. Friends, when we encounter grief in any form, my hope is that we don't minimize it or avoid it or wallow in it. May we experience the power of lament, this grand invitation to lift our hearts up to God because we know that he invites us. We know that this is an affirmation of trust and relationship with him. And we know that this will draw us closer and give way to rejoicing as he meets us with his faithfulness. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you that you can hold it all. We don't have to hide it from you. We don't have to clean ourselves up. But you invite us to come before you just as you are, just as we are. And you meet us there. In this season where our losses do feel prevalent, would you fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you comfort us with your grace, with your love, with your strength? May that give way to rejoicing and praise. May that make way for us to fully lift up and glorify your name in its entirety as we see your steadfast love, as we see your incredible character. We thank you for who you are, Lord Jesus. And it's in your holy and righteous name we pray. Amen. Stand, if you would, stand with me. No to Jesus I surrender.
You may be seated once again. But now we get the wonderful privilege of having a dialogue and interacting with the sermon and the topic for tonight. So Todd will walk around with the microphone, but want to invite you to participate in these questions. The first one is, what has been your own experience with lament? Um, is this something familiar to you, or is this somewhat of a new concept? <laughs> well, for, well, for me, I've never heard of it at all until just now. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What about a few others? Well, you know, I, I've experienced many times the opportunity to cry out to God and to complain about a situation, but the idea of, of lament and the, and the whole concept of it, or maybe a teaching, that, that's never been anything official in my life, nothing I've ever studied. and and. I mean, really investigated how different people like David, you know, lamented something. And just how bold do you get to be in that process? Yeah. If you're comfortable, um, I just want to invite for this next question. What's one or two things that you have been grieving in this season? Okay, we got to hold on because I got three texts from my mom this week saying that we have to do a better job of speaking into the microphone, okay? I'm sorry. Um, I would say one of them, obviously having a, a child and seeing their heartbreak with things that they're not able to do. Yeah. Um, as a parent, that's really difficult, you know? Yeah. Um, this is something new for everybody to deal with. And so just, I mean, he's been great but it's still heartbreaking as a parent. We it want is. them to go play sports and do all these things, but they can't. So, um, but it's also a great learning thing too. Um, and I think um, for me, it's the lack of having a cohesive um, government or people telling us what is right and wrong has been really difficult for me. Mm -hmm. That's something that I'm very frustrated with lamenting about um, because you know we hear one thing and then we hear something else and this is the safety of the family right and I have my parents that live with me so I have a whole nother dynamic so that has been really difficult and like you said not the world's not what it was at least right now and that's hard and what does that look like in the future yeah. and so I'm with you on that like it feels like one day just the world stopped and now we're in this like snow globe of crazy and we don't know what's going on and it's 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 really difficult to and and we don't have the answers for our kids and we don't even have the answers for each other other than just trying to talk through stuff so yeah that's probably my things that have touched me a lot in this last three or four months so thank you i love snow globe of crazy <laughs> snow globe of crazy <laughs> i'm gonna use that <laughs> Jacob. Just a lack of sanity. My grandparents are watching the news and they're getting scared and it makes me sad. It, it is grief because it just, it feels like they just don't want to see the good when they're watching the news. And then the lack of absolute anything in the White House, which is just sad to see our government just crumble. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Good job, Jacob. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. For me, sometimes, Brian, it's the small and the unexpected things, you know. I mean, of course you expect me to say baseball, but um, it's like watching my wife have to readapt to a new life, right? 
Um, and she's the introvert, so you would think that she would like think this is the greatest thing ever, except for she's stuck in a house with three children all the time, and she misses her, you know, 35-minute drive back and forth to work where she has her own time, and how do I figure that out and be a husband to her and take care of kids, and yeah. it's just like, it's exhausting after a while. You're just like, I'm figuring this all out again, new day by day, and it doesn't stay the same, so, yeah. It is quite taxing. Yeah. How have you expressed what you're feeling and what you're experiencing to God? What does that look like for you? And then the second part of that question is, how has God met you in that as you have cried out to him? (laughs) We're getting Todd his steps tonight. Um, uh, Jacob and I have definitely spent a lot more time in the Bible during this time. Um, And we both are praying a lot more together and out loudly together. And um, we've even gotten on our knees <laughs> and prayed with each other um, because we are seeking um, some kind of comfort. And I'm gonna say that I do get that at some, sometimes. Like I do feel like, um, I feel like he's there. Um, it's just figuring out what it all means right now. But, um, but we definitely have been spending a lot more time vocally praying with each other and it's been actually really empowering to do it together. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed that, just yeah. getting down on our knees around the bed and, and doing that, so. Montana. So I've actually learned, I tend to be pretty introverted already, and I felt like God actually taught me that his social interactions that he set up for me in the fellowship here is for my good. And I was, I was talking with Garrett Woodruff about it, and it's like I've noticed how being isolated even more has been actually pretty bad for me. And, yeah. And God is teaching me and developing my character by this interaction that I get. So for, from somebody that's a hyper introvert, you would think that it would be really good, but it's, it's not. <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Montana. My last question for tonight is, oh, in the midst of these psalms of lament, they cry out for God to respond and to act. And so what do you long for God to do? What is your prayer in this season or in a specific situation? What has been your big prayer? Um, I think my big prayer uh, during this season is that he would show us the, as believers and as the church what we had been taking for granted in, in coming to church and what what was fluff and unnecessary and what was, are the things that we are core and we need and that we would be more unified and stronger as a, as a body of believers coming through whatever the end of this or coming back to normal uh, looks like out of that and that it wouldn't divide us. That's my, yeah. my big prayer, that he would keep us united. That's great. I'm not... Okay. In our men's Bible study, uh, we prayed uh, that God would remove this pandemic and get the credit for it. And, you know, it's easy to turn to them when things are bad, but can we remember what we've learned and continue when things are good? And can that just influence other people as they see our response to come and trust Jesus? That's good. Todd, you were going to say something. I'm, I'm not sure I would have articulated it before you answered the question, but one of the things that I'm longing for is, um, you know, uh, a return to well, what seems like ra- normal ra- relationalness, the kind of relationalness that we were created for. And so one of the difficult things is, you know, God himself is um, 
three and one and is relational in his character. And then as I'm watching kids and trying to figure out what's the right thing to do for church and for youth group and all this, it's like there's a part of this that's so frustrating because it's hindering the way God wants us to be. And I just am praying that he would end this virus. And that's been our prayer at home, that this thing would go away. But the thing I'm, I'm longing for is just to be able to be the people that God want, had made us to be, to relive relationally the way I think ideally he would like us to. Amen. So. Well, before I close this in a benediction, I do want to highlight, uh, you know, my first experience in praying a lament was in a class on the Psalms in seminary, and we actually had to go find a group of people and practice this with, and uh, it was a lot of fun. We went to Rachel's missions organization that she worked for and had to lead them through a prayer of lament, and it was a pretty powerful and slightly awkward endeavor, but I uh, learned a lot through it, and so from that, uh, we have created a song, a how to pray element that walks you through the different aspects and invites you to cry out to God as you do feel these things based on the psalm that we talked about tonight. That will be on the website right under um, the video as well as on the resources and a resources and updates tab. So if that would be helpful for you, we would love for you to utilize that in helping you express and voice your own grief and lament before God's presence. So. If you would, stand with me and let me send you out with this benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, may he comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work. Amen.